Boldwood presents Villa of Sun and Secrets Written by Jennifer Bonet And read by Julia Franklin The moral right of the author has been asserted This performance is owned by Boldwood Part 1 Chapter 1 Carla was not surprised when Tante Josette didn't come to the funeral. A nondescript wreath arrived, its white flowers already wilting. The words, R.I.P. Amelia, your loving sister Josette, scrawled on a black-edged sympathy card by some unknown hand at the florists. A congregation of fewer than ten had gathered for the service. Carla knew her mother, Amelia, always a difficult person to get along with, would have been surprised at even that number. The owners of the care home, duty-bound to be there, two neighbours from Amelia's street, Carla, David and Maddie, representing the family. Edward had left the week before for South Africa. Impossible for him to return so soon. The wreath he sent his grandmother, though, was lovely. Standing in the crematorium, watching her mother's coffin disappear behind the curtains, Carla felt the first stirrings of sadness and anger. Sadness for a mother for whom she'd never felt good enough, and anger for the fact that Amelia and Tante Josette had been estranged for over 40 years. She'd written to Josette when Amelia had gone into the home, mainly to let her know about her twin sister. But a little bit of Carla had hoped Josette would visit and the two sisters would heal their decades-old rift. It wasn't to be. Josette had written back saying she was sorry to hear of Amelia's decline, but she wouldn't be coming to England to see her for one last time. It seems a pointless exercise, as you say. Amelia's mind has switched off, so she won't know me. It would be equally pointless if she were still compos mentis, because then... She wouldn't want to see me. An angry Carla had longed to reply, Come for my sake, so I can believe that the two of you once cared about each other. That somewhere in the dim and distant past, there was a loving, supportive family, in the days before we became the prototype model for a modern, dysfunctional one. But she'd recognised the truth behind Josette's words, and had sighed before throwing the letter away. Josette sat in the sunshine at her favourite pavement café on the quay in Monaco, the coffee on the table in front of her growing cold, her thoughts lost in the past. She and Amelia had often caught the train from Antibes and spent the day wandering around the principality, hoping to see some famous people. Today, though, the memory of a long-ago visit that was to change everything in their lives was on her mind. Today, for the first time in years, she'd caught the train to Monaco to say a final goodbye to her sister, in the principality where decades ago she'd been given the news that would start a chain of events that would ultimately change the course of her own life. It had been Cannes Film Festival time, and Amelia and Josette had sat at another pavement café, the Café de Paris, hoping to spot some celebrities leaving the Hôtel de Paris opposite, or even sauntering up the steps into the casino for a game of roulette. Josette had just exclaimed, Quick, look over there, I'm sure it's Sacha Distel! And turning towards Amelia to make sure she was looking in the right direction, when, to her dismay, she saw Amelia was sitting there, with tears running down her cheeks. Qu'est-ce qui se passe? I'm pregnant. Shocked, Josette stared at her twin. Is it Robert, the sailor? she had finally asked. Amelia had told her about meeting a crew member from one of the expensive yachts a few weeks ago. Twenty-three years old, he was spending the summer after his finals working on one of the prestigious boats before returning home and starting his banking career. Amelia had nodded. Papa will kill you both! Josette had said. She was silent for a moment. What does Robert say about it? 
je lui ai pas encore dit. You're the first to know, Amelia whispered. I was hoping you'd help me decide what to do. When do you expect to see Robert next? The yacht is due back in port tomorrow afternoon, so probably our usual place in the evening. You have to tell him. Once you've done that and we know his reaction, we can decide what you do. Josette had glanced at her sister. Do you love him? Do you want to keep the baby? Do you want him to marry you? Yes. No. Yes. I don't know what I want, other than I don't want to be pregnant. But you are, Josette had said, as a sudden thought struck her. You didn't go to Dr. Lefebvre, did you? The old family doctor would have gone straight to their father, she was certain. Amelia shook her head. Je suis pas si bête. I went to one in Cannes. Josette had caught hold of her sister's hand. If Robert is the kind of man I think he is, he'll marry you. But his life will be in England. I don't want to live here and live over there. I won't know anyone. And his family will probably hate me and... Stop it! Nobody could possibly hate you. And after you've married Robert and moved over there, I shall be a regular visitor. Tante Josette, imagine. Josette had looked at her sister and squeezed her hand. Try not to worry. Whatever happens, I'm on your side. The next evening, a shocked Robert had immediately said they'd marry when Amelia had told him she was pregnant. Had even braved the wrath of her father, holding her hand tightly as they broke the news together. Now, years later, Josette acknowledged Amelia's news that day had laid the foundation for the fracture that would tear their family apart in less than five years. If Amelia had never met Robert, so many lives would have been lived differently. She, Josette, wouldn't have been estranged from all the people she loved the most, would have had a stable life, instead of always being on the move from one place to another. She'd have married and had a family with... Another coffee, madame? Josette dragged her thoughts back to the present. She shook her head. No, merci. She paid for the undrunk, cold coffee before standing up and beginning to make her way up to the old town and the cathedral. Climbing the steps and strolling through the gardens to the palace, Josette took her time, stopping once or twice to admire the view out over the town and the harbour. Eventually, she passed under the arch, skirted around the cake sculpture of the infamous monk and founder of the Monaco royal family, François Grimaldi, that she, personally, always found terrifying, and on to the palace precinct. The large open forecourt in front of the palace was, as always, swarming with tourists, and Josette crossed it diagonally, aiming for the small street that led down to the cathedral. Before she reached the flight of steps leading up to the entrance, she pulled a veil-type scarf out of her bag and placed it over her head, glancing at her watch as she did so. Perfect timing. The English funeral would be underway. Inside, the ambiance of the cathedral was hushed and reverent. Josette carefully lit a candle and placed it on the stand, whispering to herself, Rapi, Amelia, je t'oublierai jamais, ma sœur chérie. She stood for a moment, eyes closed, mentally saying a final goodbye to the sister who, for some still unknown reason, had cast her out of her life all those years ago. Now, death had taken the final irreversible step of concealment of what had gone wrong between them all those years ago. Ever since the news of Amelia's death had reached her, Josette had waited for the sorrow to engulf her. Now, standing in front of the flickering candles, the tears arrived with the realisation that any possibility of a reconciliation had died with Amelia. Oblivious to the looks of other cathedral visitors, even to the gentle touch of a sympathetic hand on her arm from a stranger, Josette 
stood waiting for the tears to subside. For her mind to return to its decade-old default mode of, it's in the past, let it go. It was ten minutes before she felt strong enough to become a part of the shuffling crowd, making its way around the cathedral, past the last resting places of Princess Grace and her prince, before making for the exit. Blinking as her eyes adjusted to the bright sunlight, Josette thought about the future. She was free to do, to say, as she wanted. With Amelia's death, the need to keep her own secret had died. Hadn't it? She was the last of the family who knew the truth. If she wanted, she could shout it out to the world. There was no one to gainsay her now. But was it worth upsetting another generation of people with the truth? The Monday after the funeral, Carla collected the ashes from the crematorium before driving to her late mother's home to begin the task of sorting and clearing the house. During the three months Amelia had spent in the care home, Carla had gone to the empty house once a week to keep an eye on the place and to water the house plants. David, her husband, had encouraged her to use the time to make a start on clearing and emptying the house. We all know Amelia won't ever go back there, so it makes sense to begin getting it ready for sale. Carla had shaken her head. It might make sense, but sorry, I can't do it. She tried to explain to David that, as illogical as it was, she felt she'd be invading her mother's privacy, even though she'd have no idea what Carla was doing. It would be easier when Amelia had passed. But in truth, it was never going to be easy. Inserting the key into the lock of number 29 and letting herself in, she fancied that the house was even quieter than it had been over the last few weeks, as if the house knew Amelia was dead and had shut down on itself. Carla shook the thought away. Placing the urn on the sitting room mantelpiece, Carla went into the kitchen to make herself a coffee. Waiting for the kettle to boil, she opened the back door and went out onto the small patio her father had created years ago. Looking out over the garden, she sighed. Never a keen gardener, Amelia had abandoned the garden the year Robert had died. Since then, it had been left to Carla or David, when she could persuade him, to push the old-fashioned cylinder mower around the large patch of grass every couple of weeks in summer. The flower borders over the last ten years had simply merged into a weed-infested green border around the outside. Carla could see she'd need to get the mower out again soon. A memory flitted through her mind of the garden when it was her dad's solace from work and her mother. The Christmas he'd strung fairy lights around the bare branches of the gnarled apple tree in the far corner. Amelia had declared it an unnecessary extravagance and as soon as Christmas Day was over, she demanded the lights were taken down. They were never seen again. Back indoors, coffee made, Carla sat at the kitchen table and started to make a list of the things that she needed to organise. Emptying the house and getting it ready for sale would be her first priority. Clothes and books, charity shop. Furniture, eBay, or local second-hand shop. Perhaps joining a local Facebook buy and sell group would be the easiest option. No, getting a house clearance firm to come and take the lot would be better. She'd need to check with Maddie about the white goods. She might like the fridge for her new flat. Once the house was empty and clean, she'd contact some estate agents and get it on the market. The three or four boxes of papers and photos she knew were in a cupboard upstairs, she'd put in the car and take home with her. Go through them, deciding what needed to be kept and what could be thrown away in the comfort of her own home. Then there was the question of where to scatter Amelia's ashes. Carla stopped and glanced through the door at the urn on the mantelpiece, looking for all the world as though it had been there forever, but where it obviously couldn't stay. Another memory flashed into her mind. When her dad had died, Carla had asked Amelia if she could be with her when she scattered his ashes to say a final goodbye. Amelia had shrugged. 
too late. Down the day I got them, I throw them in the river. Carla had never hated her mother so much as she did then. Not because of scattering her dad's remains in the river. The frustrated sailor in him had always loved being down by the river. But because she'd kept silent about what she was doing and denied Carla the chance of a last goodbye. Hadn't deemed it important enough to ask her to go with her. But where to scatter Amelia? She wouldn't appreciate the river. Maybe Maddie would have an idea. There was no rush. It'd be some time yet before everything was finalized. A mobile rang. Mavis, the manager of the charity shop where Carla volunteered three mornings a week. Hi, everything all right? Carla, I'm so sorry to have to ask, and I'll understand if you can't help, but I don't suppose there's a chance of you being available this afternoon? Mavis asked. I'm one short and there's piles of stuff to sort through out the back of the shop. Two o'clock, okay? I need to talk to you about some of Mum's stuff too, Carla said. Great, see you then. Thanks, lovely, Mavis said. Carla put the phone back in her bag. Looking out of the kitchen window at the grey day, she had a sudden longing to be somewhere else. Living a different life to the one she got up every day to exist through. David had never wanted her to work, insisting her job was the family, which, when the twins, Ed and Maddie, had been young, was true. Her life had revolved around their needs, her social life around fundraisers for the PTA, brownies, scouts, ballet, football. You name the club, she had probably baked cakes for it. But these days, that was all gone. With the twins away and David busier and busier with the business, she was spending a lot of time alone. As she put her bag over her shoulder and picked up her keys ready to leave, Carla came to a decision. Once her mum's affairs were all settled, she was going to change her life and start enjoying it again. Just how she would accomplish that, she had yet to decide, but one thing was certain. She would insist she and David spent more time together. The days were lengthening, and the spring bulbs in the front garden were beginning to flower before number 29 was finally clean and empty. Carla instructed the local estate agents, who arrived to measure up and take photographs, ready for the house to go on the market once probate was finalised. One evening in early March, Carla sat at her own kitchen table with the last box of her mother's papers and photos to sort. The previous five boxes had been uninspiring. But this one contained more photographs and paperwork. And Carla had saved it for last deliberately. Secretly, she was hoping the photographs would give her a silent insight into the largely unknown history of her maternal French family. Faded black and white photos of mysterious foreign relatives standing staunchly arm in arm on some mountainside. A Provençal masse. Wide-eyed children fastened into cavernous whale-bellied prams. Two laughing little girls holding hands in a hayfield. Amelia et Josette, juin 1950, faintly penciled on the back. Two older girls paddling on the beach holding their skirts high above their knees. Amelia et Josette, juillet 1962. Proof that the twins had once been close. A wedding photo, dated September 1964, taken on the steps of an imposing hotel de ville, showed her mother and father smiling in a stiff, grown-up wedding pose. Josette standing to one side, looking happy. What row in later years could possibly have been serious enough to keep them apart forevermore? Carla jumped as David appeared at her side with a glass of wine. Anything worth keeping amongst this lot, or do we burn it all? He asked, pushing some of the photos apart. I can't just burn things, Carla protested. It's my family history. I need to go through it. Maybe identify who I can. Then the box can go in the cupboard in the spare room. Maddie's keen on genealogy, 
Perhaps you'll want to do the family tree one day. David picked up a sealed envelope marked Josette, private and confidential. I wonder what this is. Shall I open it? Carla took the envelope from him and examined it curiously. Tempting as it is, I don't think we should open it. I'll put it to one side and pop it in the post to Josette next time I go to the post office. I don't suppose it contains anything of earth-shattering importance to her, though. You could always go for a visit. Deliver it personally, David said. You could do with a break after the last couple of months. Carla looked at him. True, but you'd be on your own. Now both the children are living away. For God's sake, Carla, I'm quite capable of looking after myself, you know. You haven't been around looking after me recently anyway. I didn't have the choice. Mum's house had to be sorted. I'm sorry you feel hard done by, but you were busy too. There weren't many evenings when you were even home to eat dinner. She didn't add, and you were clearly too busy to even offer to help me. No point in coming home when you weren't here. Easier to work late and eat at the club before coming home. David's look challenged her to argue. But she couldn't summon the energy, so she ignored it. Don't worry about me, a break could do you good, David said. At least think about it. To be honest, I'm not sure about visiting Tante Josette. It's not as if she's ever issued an invitation. Carla looked at David. Are you busy at work for the next few weeks? We could go together. Not a chance, David said. You don't have to stay with Josette. Just hand her the envelope, and if she doesn't want to talk, you've done your bit. Find a hotel and have a few days' holiday. Carla shook her head. I don't want to go alone. It's better to post the envelope. I'll finish going through everything in here, in case there's anything else marked for her. David shrugged. Whatever. A day later, the sorted box of photos was ready to go into the cupboard in the spare room. Pushing it onto the bottom shelf, Carla met with resistance and dropped to her knees to see what was blocking the way. An old shoebox had somehow wedged itself across the back, and as Carla tugged it free, the lid moved, and she saw the black velvet jeweler's box. Christmas was over months ago, and it was too early for her birthday. Had David planned to give her a surprise? Something to help ease the pain of the last few months. Carefully, she took the diamond pendant necklace out of the box and held it against her neck. Beautiful. As she did so, a piece of paper fluttered out of the lid onto the floor. Darling Lisa, all my love, David. Carla felt a stab of real pain reading the words and tears spilled down her cheeks. After the stress of the last few months, she didn't know if she could cope with David having another affair. Her fingers trembled as she replaced the necklace in its box. He'd promised so often that each time was the last, that it was Carla he truly loved, and begged her forgiveness. She knew that if she confronted him about Lisa, he'd do the same this time. She stood up, clutching the velvet box. She mentally straightened her shoulders. This time, she wasn't in a forgiving mood. Twenty-four hours later, without a word to anyone, Carla fled to France and Tante Josette. Chapter Two The Hôtel de Ville clock struck the hour as the taxi driver took Carla's suitcase out of the boot and pointed. He didn't bother to ask if she could manage, just took his fare and drove away. Carla dragged her suitcase the twenty meters in the direction he'd indicated and looked around. The townhouse Josette lived in was hidden away in the old town of Antibes, down a narrow rue where few cars dared to venture. The sea was thirty meters away as the gulls flew, a three-minute walk via the ramparts for everyone else. An old collie, sleeping in the doorway of a decrepit building, opened an eye, 
before deciding she was not interesting enough to disturb his slumber, and closed it again. Tall, medieval houses faced each other across the cobbled street. Two, near the small square with the ancient wisteria and the even older fountain, were linked by an arch with a window overlooking the narrow rue. Geraniums in pots hanging from its open shutters. Scaffolding was pinned to one of the houses, workmen on its planks, whistling as they filled cracks and holes with grey mortar. Josette's house, when Carla finally stood in front of it, was as shabby as its neighbours. But its front door had been painted a defiant scarlet. There was no bell or knocker, so Carla banged on the door with her fist. Above her head, a window opened. If that's you, Gordon, the door is open. Just give it a push. Anyone else wet outside? I'll be down in a moment. The window slammed shut. Carla stayed where she was. Inside, a shadow flitted past the small window to the right. Seconds later, the door opened. Bonjour, Tante Josette, Carla said. May I come in, please? It's an emergency, sort of, she added. Josette's blue eyes stared at her, as if trying to gauge the depth of her emergency, before she shrugged and turned away. Don't see why not. I have a bottle of rosé in the fridge. Carla stepped over the threshold, closed the front door behind her, and followed Josette into the open plan room with its beams and unlit log-burning stove. French doors opened from the kitchen area into a courtyard full of pots of lavender and gaudy geraniums, where jasmine and honeysuckle entwined together, covering the walls. A pair of pigeons canoodled in a recess in the corner, taking off with ruffled feathers as Josette shouted at them. A green wrought iron table with matching chairs, made comfortable with cushions covered in the inevitable Provencal blue and yellow fabric, was placed in a corner. A large, square, white parasol provided shelter from the overhead sun. Josette poured two generous glasses of wine and handed one to Carla. Santé! They clicked glasses before Josette asked, Why are you here? I told you, I had an emergency. Carla hesitated before saying, You didn't come for the funeral. I thought maybe you would. I sent a wreath. You came to berate me? No, I have several reasons for coming. One of them is to learn about the French side of the family. Mum never told me much. You're the last one who can tell me. I also wanted to spend some time with you. A spot of aunt-niece bonding, if you like. The last reason is... Carla stopped and drained her glass. The last reason can wait. Any more wine in that bottle? Josette phoned Gordon once she was certain Carla was busy making up the bed in the spare room. We'll have to forget our island excursion for a while, she said. My niece has come for a visit. She might like to come with us, Gordon suggested. Peut-être, but not this week. Just things on her mind. Do I get to meet this niece of yours? Maybe I'll invite you to supper later in the week, if she stays that long. Putting the phone down, Josette placed another bottle of wine in the fridge, before returning to the courtyard and sitting at the table, closing her eyes and thinking about Carla's words. Merde. She wasn't mentally prepared for this encounter. Aunt niece bonding. Learn about the French family. Both ridiculous notions. It was far too late for more than a superficial telling of family history. Josette prayed Carla wouldn't push her quest for information about the family too far. The truth could serve no real purpose now. Thirty, twenty, even ten years ago when... Josette shook her head. She decided in the cathedral the morning of the funeral the truth was best left to be buried with her when she died. She wouldn't be leaving one of those tell-all-when-I'm-gone letters, either. I brought some photos, 
Carla said, joining her at the table, holding two large envelopes. Josette opened her eyes and came back to the present with a start. Carla had changed into a floral maxi dress. Her feet were bare and her hair was pinned up haphazardly. Her knees had grown into an attractive woman in the thirty years since she'd last seen her. I can't believe you're fifty this year. You certainly got the right kind of genes, Josette said. You're not the only one who can't believe it, Carla said. I find the prospect terrifying, particularly now. Josette looked at her and waited. But Carla shook her head. Later. And she opened one of the envelopes and began to hand things to Josette. Pictures of Maddie and Edward, she said, holding photographs out to Josette. Josette took the photos. Twins, like her and Amelia. A great nephew and niece she'd never met. Knew only the basic facts about them and their lives. What are they up to these days? Edward is doing locum veterinary work in South Africa. Maddie's just starting her own PR business. Here's a photograph of them, taken at Christmas last year. Josette looked at the photos of her great nephew and niece, inwardly regretting the years of enforced separation. This is one of the last photos of Mum, Carla said quietly, handing over another picture. Josette stared at the picture of Amelia her late sister. The family likeness to their mother had strengthened down the years. Both had the thin lips that had shriveled into hard lines as they'd aged, and the bitterness in them had shown. It's hard to believe you were twins, Carla said. Mum changed so much as she aged, whereas you, she shrugged, you've always looked the same to me on the rare occasions I've seen you. Was she very difficult at the end? Josette asked, ignoring the last comment. No more than usual, Carla said simply. Once her mind had gone, she did become more aggressive, though, especially to me. Nothing I did was right. Josette nodded thoughtfully and was silent for several seconds before asking, What's in the other packet? Photos of babies and people I assume are French relatives. I'm hoping you'll be able to tell me who they are and fill me in on some family history, Carla said, picking it up and pulling another envelope out. And I found this amongst Mum's things. It's marked private and confidential with your name on it. I was going to post it, but... She shrugged. Things happened? And it seemed a good idea to deliver it personally. Thanks. Josette turned the bulky sealed envelope over in her hands before glancing at Carla. Did you open it? No. David wanted to, but I wouldn't have been happy opening something so clearly marked for someone else. Are you going to open it? Josette shook her head. No, not tonight. She stood up and went into the house and pushed the envelope into the bottom drawer of the kitchen dresser. The one where she threw miscellaneous things that might come in useful one day. She didn't need to open the envelope. She knew without looking inside what it would contain. It could stay in the drawer until the next time she lit the wood burner. Then she would burn it, destroy the evidence forever. Carla watched through the open doorway as Josette closed the dresser drawer with an impatient push. At 73, Josette was still slim. Her white hair was folded into a tidy French pleat. Her fingernails, neat and rounded, painted a soft coral, and like her toes, with their flashes of scarlet peeping out from her strappy sandals. As a teenager, Carla had been fascinated by this enigmatic aunt of hers and longed to get to know her better. Decades ago, she'd asked her mother why they didn't see more of Josette, more of any of their French relatives, in fact, and received the brusque answer, family rift. No details were ever volunteered. Amelia had relented, once, when Carla was about nine. The three of them, Carla and her parents, had travelled to Antibes for her grandmother's funeral. Young as she was, Carla had sensed the tension between her mother, Josette, and her grandfather, both in the church 
and back at the villa for the wake. It had been the only time during her childhood Carla had seen her aunt. When her grandfather had died a year later, Amelia had gone to France alone, leaving Carla at home with her father for five days. She mixes with the wrong sort and moves around a lot, had been her mother's excuse when a teenage Carla had asked why they didn't see Josette. But the year Carla was due to go to Paris with the college, a Christmas card arrived with a Parisian address, a telephone number, and a scrawled message, living in the city of light for a while. Secretly, Carla copied the contact details, and daringly rang her aunt. For two hours, they'd sat and chatted in a small cafe on the left bank. Josette's interested in Carla's life, deflecting questions about her own. When Carla had asked if they could keep in regular touch, Josette replied it was best to leave things as they were. But any emergency, and she'd be there to help if she could. She'd told Carla not to forget that she travelled a lot in her freelance photography job, so couldn't promise to always be available. Down the years, Carla had contacted her at different times hoping to chat, but Josette had always been strictly impassive. Not an emergency, is it? she'd ask, and the conversation would stall. Well, now she had a crisis, and thankfully Josette had taken her in, although, admittedly, Carla had given her little choice. We'll eat supper out tonight, Josette said, returning to the courtyard and shrugging herself into an ancient linen jacket. Nothing fancy, she added. Plus in the market, does good pasta. When they got to the market, restaurants lining the pedestrian side of the market had placed tables and chairs where, earlier, trestles piled with fruit and vegetables had stood. Josette ignored the restaurant tables without cloths and offering cheap plastic chairs, making straight for a restaurant where the tables were covered with pink and white checked cloths and the chairs had comfortable woven cane seats. Bonsoir, Josette, the patron said kissing her cheek before shaking Carla's hand in welcome as Josette introduced her. Ça va? A carafe of house red appeared on the table as Josette looked at the menu before ordering carbonara. Carla ordered a salad niçoise. You don't like pasta? Josette asked. I just don't fancy it tonight, Carla said. A salad will be fine. I'm not very hungry. She picked up her glass already filled by an attentive waiter, and looked at Josette. David's got a mistress, she said, again. So find yourself a lover, Josette replied. Stunned, Carla laughed. <laughs> if only it was that easy. It is. Carla shook her head. I haven't got the energy to fight tit for tat. Waste of time, too, I think. Having good sex is never a waste of time. Josette said. Mind you, it has to be good sex. Merci. She addressed the young waiter, placing their cutlery and the bread basket on the table. One bam and thank you, ma'am, does not constitute good sex, however desperate you are. I learned that a long time ago. She picked a piece of baguette out of the basket before saying, Maybe we can find you a French lover while you're here. I can't believe we're having this conversation, Carla said. I didn't come for advice about my sex life. What did you come for? Carla swirled the wine in her glass, round and round for several minutes, before looking up at Josette. I told you, to learn about the French family, and I needed to get away. Coming here seemed as good an option as any. But if it's a problem, I'll find a hotel tomorrow. Josette shrugged. Up to you? Just don't expect me to behave like your average aunt, dispensing good advice. Never been my thing, and I'm too old to change now. Encore du vin? she asked, picking up the carafe. Carla lay on the bed in the small guest room at the back of the house, staring up at the ceiling. Her body tired, but incapable of overruling her active mind and sleeping. 
What was she doing here? Her problem might now be a thousand miles away, but it still existed. She glanced at her watch. Ten o'clock in the UK. Had David read the cryptic note she'd left propped against the coffee machine, telling him she was going away for a few days to think things through? Or was he out with his lover? Maybe she should have stayed, patiently ridden out the storm and taken him back when the affair ended, as it would, she had no doubt, in about six months. Heavens, it was their silver wedding next year. How could they not celebrate that together? Instead, she'd run away within 24 hours of learning about the affair, telling no one where she was going. As the plane had flown southwards, high above France, the unexpected sense of delicious freedom that had engulfed her as she'd obtained the last available seat on the flight had evaporated, leaving a drowning sense of despair in its place. She closed her eyes. What had she hoped to gain by coming here? By conveniently running away, she'd inadvertently given David the freedom to engineer more adulterous meetings with this Lisa, whoever she was. More time to see a lawyer. Get things organised in his favour. Damn it! She wasn't some deluded little woman, clinging to her man, no matter what he subjected her to. But of all the things she'd been expecting to happen in the rest of her life, leaving David wasn't one of them. That wasn't what she'd anticipated at all. She didn't know if she was strong enough to survive on her own, even as the magazines kept telling her it was technically her time. She'd coped with his affairs before, making a scene over only one of them in the early days when he'd complained of feeling neglected when the twins were newborn. Hurt and humiliated, she'd decided to stay to give the children a secure childhood. Later, his redundancy and the setting up of his own advertising business had made finances tight and divorce too expensive an option. There would have been nothing to divide between them. The house, mortgaged to the hilt and signed over as security for the business, certainly wouldn't have raised enough money to provide her and the children with a home. She suspected he didn't even realise she knew about any of the others. Elaine, the dentist, Fiona, his bank manager, were just two she remembered from down the years. And now, this unknown Lisa. Did she work with David? A new secretary he'd employed? Maybe she was one of the new assistants he'd talked about employing and taken on to ease the workload. Carla shifted restlessly as she remembered toying with the idea of leaving when Maddie and Edward left home for university. But by then, her life with David had morphed into a habit. It had been easier to stay than go. Water gurgled its way along a pipe above her head as Josette brushed her teeth in the small bathroom across the landing. Carla sighed, picturing her aunt getting ready for bed. She hadn't exactly welcomed her with open arms, but at least she let her stay. Hopefully she'd mellow as they got to know each other, although she was certainly living up to her family reputation of being a loner. Self-contained and undemonstrative were the words used by Amelia once to describe her twin sister to Carla. She clearly hadn't changed as she'd aged. The bathroom door opened and closed. A tap on the bedroom door before Josette pushed it open. Carla turned her head and regarded her aunt. I don't sleep too well these days, Josette said. 5.30 usually finds me downstairs. Don't feel obliged to get up early. Although I doubt that you'll sleep beyond seven o'clock anyway. Bonne nuit. The door closed before Carla could answer. Chapter Three There was no sign of Josette when Carla made her way downstairs the next morning. Josette had been right about Carla not sleeping after seven. When the nearby town hall clock had boomed the hour, she'd woken with a jolt. There was a note on the kitchen table. Croissants in the tin, help yourself. Coffee ready to go. See you later. J. Was Josette deliberately avoiding her? Taking her breakfast out into the courtyard, 
Carla thought about the day ahead. Ringing Maddie was the first priority. She needed to speak to her before she turned up at the house and discovered her absence. Edward was away for at least another three months, so she didn't need to bother him right now. He'd promised to try and get back for her big birthday later in the year. Things should have sorted themselves out by then, one way or another. Carla looked at her mobile. 8 a.m. here, 7 a.m. in the UK. Maddie would be busy getting ready for work. How do you tell your grown-up daughter that her parents' marriage had suffered an earthquake fracture off the Richter scale? Risk the blunt truth? Dad's having another affair and I had to get away. Or try to soften the news. We're having a few problems, so we've decided to have some time apart to sort things out. Make it sound like a joint decision, not hers alone. Was there a chance that this separation was not permanent? That David would break it off with his latest mistress, grovel and apologise and promise to behave in the future? Was that what she wanted to happen? The booming chimes of the Hotel de Ville clock striking once again died away as Carla selected Maddie's number and listened to the ringing tone. When the message service clicked in, she switched off. Leaving Maddie a message about the current situation wasn't an option. She had to break the news to her in voice, if not face to face. A break in the sound of footsteps in the street was followed by a bang on the front door. Carla hesitated. Should she open the door? Her limited French was rusty, and she dreaded struggling to make herself understood with a stranger. As she stood there undecided, she heard the footsteps walking away. Relieved not to have to take any action, Carla realised she'd been holding her breath. Josette was still not back when Carla left to explore the town. She knew little about the place where her mother and aunt had been born, other than it had long been an ancient trading port, with its fortifications built by the French engineer Sébastien Vauban. The town's modern marina, Port Vauban, was named in his honour. A brisk onshore breeze was whistling around the narrow rue of the old town as Carla walked away from the market area. A narrow alley led her to the ramparts, and she walked along the coastal road until she reached the bottom of Boulevard Albert Premier, near an open park area. Without stopping to think, Carla stepped off the pavement looking to her right, rather than her left, and found herself jerked from under the wheels of a car by a man who pulled her back onto the pavement. A furious fist wave and an angry honking of the horn from the driver emphasised how close the car had been to knocking her down. Shocked, Carla tried to stop shaking. In a daze, she realised the man had his arm around her shoulders and was leading her to a nearby café. Du café, s'il vous plaît, he called out to the waiter while he gently eased Carla onto a seat. Prenez des respirations profondes, he instructed, sitting down opposite her and watching her. Carla closed her eyes and tried to stop the thumping of her heart. How could she have been so stupid? Vous êtes anglaise, the man said. Carla nodded. Yes. In that case, I translate. You need to take deep breaths. He watched her for several seconds, making sure she did as he said. Your habit is to look right. Here, you have to look left. It is a mistake the English make all the time. Two coffees were placed on the table in front of them, a sachet of sugar and a small biscuit in each saucer. Whilst the man opened his sugar packet and poured it into his coffee, Carla automatically placed hers to one side. She'd stopped taking sugar in coffee a long time ago. May I suggest you take the coffee with sugar this time? Good for shock, I think. Carla sighed, but obediently emptied the sugar into her coffee, stirred it, and took a couple of mouthfuls. She pulled a face. Gross. She looked at the man. Thank you for what you did. I was lucky you were there, otherwise... She shuddered. 
I think you will remember better to look both ways now. He said, good, you have stopped shaking, and the color is returned to your face. Carla picked up the biscuit, tore the plastic open, and took a small bite. You are at the beginning of a vacance? A man asked, picking up his Demitas coffee cup. Carla nodded. Yes, I'm visiting my aunt for a few days. Easier to agree than to admit to a stranger she'd run away. I hope you enjoy your stay, he answered. No, I must go. I am late for a meeting. He stood up and placed a few euros on the bill in the saucer that had arrived with the coffees. Please, let me pay for the coffees, Carla said. I owe you that, at least. The man brushed aside her protest. No, it is my pleasure. But please, remember to look left in future. Definitely, Carla promised. Ciao. And he left. Carla finished her biscuit, and when the waiter came to clear the table, ordered a fresh cup of coffee, which she drank without sugar. Feeling better, she was about to make a move when her mobile rang. Maddie. Mom, your phone sounds funny. Are you okay? What's going on? I've had Dad on the phone saying you've left him. Carla caught her breath. Damn, David had got to Maddie before her. She took a deep breath. I'm fine. I was hoping to talk to you before Dad did. I just need some time away to think about the future. Why? What's happened? Carla took a deep breath. David clearly hadn't explained his part in her decision to leave. Time for Maddie to learn the truth. Dad's having an affair. Maddie's shocked. What? Was barely audible. The question that followed, How'd you know? was a little louder. Conscious of the interested looks from a couple at a nearby table who clearly understood English, Carla kept her own voice low. Maddie, I'll call you later. I'm in a cafe at the moment. It's not very private. That's another thing. Where are you? Dad thought you might be with me. I think that's why he rang me. I'll ring you this evening and explain everything, Carla said. Seven o'clock? A good time for you? Yes. Mom, I love you. Carla pressed the off button on her own phone. What a morning. Josette had told Carla the truth when she said she didn't sleep well and was up early most mornings. But getting out of the house and walking along the coast road was not a part of her normal routine. Generally, she made for one of the cafes in the market for a coffee. Today, though, she'd needed to get out and walk by the sea in an effort to try to organise her thoughts before Carla started to ask her inevitable questions about the family. As Josette strode along, she thought about Carla. The last person she'd expected to see when she'd opened the door yesterday. How big was the crisis in her marriage? How long was she planning on staying? How little she knew her. How much family history could she divulge without devastating her world? Did she need to know the truth? How would she react? Would she accept a sanitized version of the family history? Or would she want to dig deeper? Ask more questions. Sitting on a bench by the Plage de la Salie and staring out over the Mediterranean, hoping for inspiration, the questions continued to go round and round in Josette's mind. Answers, though, were elusive. Watching a pair of seagulls fighting over the remains of a discarded takeaway burger, a troubled Josette came to a decision. A promise was a promise even if it had been made under pressure decades ago. She'd carry on keeping it. Any question of Carla's, she could answer honestly. And for Josette, that was the key word. She would. Any others? She'd shrug her shoulders and say nothing. Keep her fingers crossed that Carla would learn enough to satisfy her and not press for more information. In the meantime, she'd try and enjoy having Carla as a house guest and introduce her to some of the Côte d'Azur sites. Life could be lonely at times. Having company for a little while would be good. Maybe some bonding would be possible, even at this late stage, if she dodged the problem questions and skirted around others carefully. Walking home 
She stopped off at the markets and picked up salad and some sardines, a baguette and two individual tartes au citron from the artisan boulangerie stand, and that was lunch sorted. She'd cook Carla lunch on her tiny barbecue in the courtyard. Josette had been home for ten minutes when Carla banged the door. Letting her in, Josette took a key off a hook near it. You'd better have this while you're here, she said handing the key to Carla. Don't lose it. It's my last spare one. Lunch will be ready in about ten minutes. Wine's in the fridge. Carla set the table and made the salad, before pouring two glasses of wine and taking them out to the courtyard, while Josette barbecued the sardines. Santé, Josette said, taking her glass. Did you have a good morning, exploring? Carla laughed. Yes, thanks, apart from when I nearly walked under a car. Ah, uh, the old right versus the left mistake. Carla nodded. Thankfully, this man grabbed me and literally pulled me to safety. Took me ages to stop shaking. I had fun exploring afterwards, though. A couple of places I vaguely remembered from when we came to Nana's funeral. The market, for one. Oh, and the Picasso Museum. Did you see the old family home? No. To be honest, I wouldn't recognize it if I saw it. We'll take a walk sometime and I'll show you. It's rented out at the moment, but the current tenants leave soon, Josette said, which means I have weeks of hassle trying to find new ones. So many fraudsters about these days. I would have thought the villa would have been sold years ago, Carla said, when Grandpapa died. Under French law, Amelia and I inherited it together.